we've got the one and only Lisa Daftari, who is a investigative journalist focusing on foreign affairs with a specialization in the Middle East and has done a lot of content around Iran. You might have seen her on Instagram and other such social media channels. She's a regular in terms of the networks where she's been an on-air political analyst at Fox News, featured on CBS, NBC, PBS, Washington Post, Voice of America, and also the founder and editor-in-chief of the Foreign Desk, which is an international news and US foreign policy website. Have I done any justice with that research on you and your background, Lisa? More than generous. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Were you always political? Is this something that when you were young, you were always destined to do? No, not at all. And I don't even consider what I do political, which I know it sounds crazy because what I follow is politics. <laughs> Look, I'm the daughter of Iranian immigrants to the United States. My parents moved to the United States in hopes of my father finishing his study and going studies and going back to Iran. And that was right before the revolution. When the revolution happened, of course, they changed their plans. And they knew that their future was going to be right here in the United States. My siblings and I were all born in the United States on the East Coast. We grew up, obviously, very nationalistic in terms of being aware of the blessings and opportunities that were now afforded to us in a free country like the United States, but also aware that we had to be transplanted because of a revolution that made life not so free for the Iranian people. And therefore, that is why we are here. So I grew up, even though this wasn't, in, it wasn't spoken about in terms of politics, but it was talked about in terms of social, environmental changes to all of our families, why we were here in the United States and, and all of that. For that reason, I grew up with that kind of eye on the world. And I felt like I had that perspective where my perhaps peers did not. Then when 9-11 happened, I remember that, and when I went to school, I was going to either go to medical school or law school only because I was good at school. That's really the reason why you choose something that's academically challenging. And I really enjoy every subject. So I enjoyed science and I enjoyed math and I enjoyed writing and I enjoyed readings, really could have enjoyed a long list of vocations. I think when it came down to it, 9-11 happened. And I remember at that point thinking to myself, the media here in the United States has no idea what just happened. We as Iranians, we know what's about to happen. We know that ideology that basically ruined and took over our country was now spreading and was now here in the United States. Fast forward to 2023, and here we are. I still believe that it is my Iranian background that gives me that perspective and that edge in understanding what's going on and connecting all the dots from Tehran all the way to whether it's Washington, D.C., or what's going on in Israel, what's going on in Yemen and Lebanon and Syria and Iraq, and the list goes on and on. Um, so it was definitely my background, and I think that experience where I have this phone nostalgia for an Iran that I never knew. Uh, I, I learned about through my parents' stories. And therefore, I, looked at, I look at the world through many different lenses, one of which being a family that experienced a revolution and therefore now sees the West and the East in, in, in a different light. Yeah, really interesting. I think those that are old enough remember where they were when 9-11 happened, I remember where I was. I was starting out in the world of recruitment and headhunting, and there was alarms going off in terms of, we had an office manager saying, oh, there's a plane coming to London, according to all reports, and everyone was getting lost in the fog of war, and we had to leave early and go back home, and then you would tune into the TV and watch it relentlessly, and what was unfolding. It was quite remarkable how much yeah. time has gone by, but yet it feels as if it was yesterday. Right. And it's interesting that you mentioned that and in terms of politics being a love of yours, what made you want to set up and be a founder of your own kind mm -hmm. of business area or politics desk? Yeah, great question. I think when I was working at Fox News, living in, in New York, and for every 10 stories that I would pitch, one of them would stick. And I understood that this is around 
between 2009, that's when I first started there, and 2000, let's say 14, which is the peak of ISIS. And we saw the, it was just after all the different Arab Springs that, that happened. And you had ISIS was going on its rampage in Syria and Iraq. And you had stories coming out of every single country in the Middle East. This was really right after another intifada in Israel. And I thought to myself, perhaps the American news consumer doesn't have as much of an appetite for these foreign stories. And I can understand why. We have so much to worry about here at home, particularly now. But there is there's a reason that they need to know a lot of these stories and they need to know them through an American lens. And that's really what I do. And I, I trained that way because of my time at Fox and learning and, and at NBC before that, where I was a producer in the investigative unit, where you learn how to feed them the broccoli, right? So you have to become creative at presenting these important stories in a way that's easy to follow, easy to understand, educational, but raises awareness about something much bigger. And that's exactly what the Foreign Desk was set up to do. It was basically a landing page for all the stories that wouldn't get onto the mainstream media, but they were very important. These weren't a niche kind of stories where you're like, oh, this girl has a foreign policy fetish and therefore she's reporting on these micro minuscule things that have nothing to do with the rest of the world. They weren't. They were actually bringing attention to a lot of things. And, and funny enough, when I started doing that, a lot of the mainstream media started picking up on stories. So we basically became a wire for a lot of mainstream media publications. Even Drudge Report would, would basically pick up stories from us like a couple times a week because we were breaking stories. We were actually getting stories from Syria and Iraq and the border and all kinds of stories, whether they were foreign policy, cybersecurity, counterterrorism, border immigration stories that really affect us all. So the Foreign Desk was set up basically to bring the broccoli to the West and bring that important information to the West in terms of news consumption, but to really make it important, really focused and like bullet points. So we do a daily top 10 newsletter, for example, it's quick people who get it and it's free. So people who get it are like, oh my God, I rely on this in terms of setting up my day and knowing my news. And we have news executives on our mailing list and we have CEOs and a lot of important opinion shapers and, and opinion makers that really rely on these kinds of stories in terms of knowing what's going on around the world, because the mainstream media, it just doesn't have that breadth of, of coverage. Yeah. And I, I do broccoli, I must say. Yeah, I like it too, but maybe it's because it was presented to me in a nice way. I don't Not know. Not so much, but yeah. There is breathtaking ignorance though around Iran, generally in the mainstream. And there isn't the same nuance or sensitivities around other causes or areas of politics than all around Iran. Mm -hmm. And right. equating Iran, sometimes the, the blatantly ignorant, well, part of the Arab world, no. One of the Arab countries, no. Iran's a distinct culture, it's not Arab. Were you, because of your origins, were you always fascinated by Iran in terms of what you do, and it shaped a lot of what you do around the Middle East and Iran yes. and what's going on. Yes, absolutely. Fascinated in, on many levels. First, from a very young age, I understood, and when, maybe it's because of my parents' stories or whatever it was, but it wasn't anything that was indoctrinated. It was a, almost like a sense of differentiating between the Iranian people and their government. I remember the first history paper I had to write was in eighth grade. And I chose to write about the Iran revolution because I wanted my teachers, my peers to get a sense of the Iranian people are not camel riding, terrorist supporting extremists. They're just like you and me. And not only that, but when you look at the Middle East as a whole, a, a country like Iran does stand out where the people are so different from that extremist government. They're not a very religious population. They're not an extreme population. They're actually very forward thinking, very modern. Of course, I know nowadays you see a lot of the pictures coming out from the 70s. That's what I grew up with, understanding that my mother went to university in Iran. My mother wore her mini skirts and her platform boots and she looked great. And now when you look at the women in Iran, where a woman who's 22 years old should get beaten to death for showing a little bit of her hair. There's a huge kind of regression that happened there. And that's basically what I picked up on and always wanted to tell the world about. So it started with telling the human story of the Iranian people and their experiences. 
And that's why it edges on politics, because it's the politics that got them to where they are. But it really and still continues to be the human stories that drive what I do. When I look at Iran, and I think this last Masa Amini movement, which was the last year, again, this 22-year-old Kurdish Iranian woman who was beaten to death, was the kind of catalyst that started a, 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 a movement that was led by women, but it wasn't just about women, it was the first time we saw Iranians being united in one message, which was regime change. They didn't want reforms. It wasn't about an election. It wasn't an egg protest. It wasn't a bazaar protest. It wasn't a teacher's protest. It was a pure grassroots movement when they were all on the same page, where you saw protests in clerical cities like Mashhad or Qom, which are typically very religious and clerical, and they usually are the ones who rally around the flag because it benefits them to be close to the government in that socioeconomic bracket. But we saw a lot of unity among all economic and cultural ethnic backgrounds. We saw it in rural and urban areas. Whereas in 2009, the Green Revolution was more like the cool kids of Tehran protests. This was a much more expansive and unified protest. And we wondered, to get to your original question, we wondered where was the world on this? This is a very easy movement to get behind. Why wouldn't you support Women saying we don't want to cover our hair. Why wouldn't you support protesting a government that kills peaceful protesters who rounds them up by the hundreds in a university that is comparable to MIT and the the brains and the few of, of the country it rounds them up and takes them to prison and puts them in the political ward? Why wouldn't you get behind such a movement? And then when you fast forward to what we're seeing on the streets of London and New York and Los Angeles today, where you have actually have pro-Hamas protests, then you begin to understand why there has been such a shift in global opinion, whether it's the new generation, whether it's academia, whether it's the woke movement, whether it's a cross-sectionality of all these different things that has made the world really stand on its head. You, we started out speaking about 9-11. If you juxtapose the environment around 9-11, where everyone was like, oh my gosh, they're the bad guys, and we're the good guys or the ones who are actually fighting for freedom. You saw American flags everywhere. Everyone, whether they voted for Bush or they didn't, were very much supportive of him going and doing whatever it was. It turned out to be a, a, a disastrous mess in the Middle East, but... I'm talking about the initial weeks after 9-11, the unity that we saw in this country, we would never see pro-Al-Qaeda protests here and saying, oh, the United States had it coming, or the United States deserved this, or we're, we're, there's another side to this, or Al-Qaeda has a point. We never saw that sentiment. But really, when you put these side by side and you see what's going on today, there's such a different sentiment. And that's why we didn't see so much support for the Iranian women. That's why we need to correct this narrative. And again, it comes from a place of humanity and understanding what people are going through and why there is good versus evil in this kind of dichotomy that we set up. It absolutely starts with Iran. And that is why in my professional work, which uh, obviously is informed by my family and my personal feelings for the Iranian people. And again, I've never stepped foot on Iranian soil, but I talk to Iranians and I interview them daily, it's a, a close connection that we have because we understand them and they feel misunderstood. And my job has always been to bring that voice out and be their voice and allow them to project it in a way that's meaningful to the mainstream media here in the West. Yeah. I lived in Iran for four years during the Iran-Iraq war and the cult of death, mm. what the a cult time. of death Islamic <laughs> Republic revolution. And also went back several times, one of which was when Khatami, the smiling, lying cleric with so-called reformers, which were the, the best marketing mm -hmm. department for the Islamic Republic, and the students were out on the streets and promised all these reforms, and it was all a load of baloney. Um, and when it came to 2009, where is my vote with Ahmadinejad and him? Mm -hmm competing in an election with Musabi and the whole green movement came about. Back then it was about evolution. It wasn't revolution. They weren't ready as of yet for revolution, for full revolution. They still thought that they could reform, hope to reform this yeah. Islamic Republic. And as we all know, it's not possible. It's all a load of smoke and mirrors. 
at that time, Lisa, there was purported to be to two million Iranians on the streets of Tehran at the mm -hmm. height of one of the major protests yeah. because they didn't have time to organize in terms of the suppressive forces because it was prior to the point where it was then outlawed in terms of public gatherings by Ahmadinejad and then was sanctioned vis-a-vis -vis by Ali mm -hmm. Khamenei, the supreme leader. And it was an earthquake as described by the BBC at that time. And unfortunately, Musavi and Karubi, which was the ex-head of the parliament, parliamentary speak, he wore a white turban. He told the people to go home. Mm -hmm. And then we had the mm -hmm. iconic Neda Sultani scene where she was shot and you had that blood coming from her mouth. And then they interviewed Obama on CNN, another such network, networks. I remember him saying, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. And he gave those red lines. He gave it with Syria, with the use of chemical weapons. And each time, Correct. those so-called red lines were never, ever filled and followed up on in terms of actually, I mean what I say. And instead, the Ayatollah has got billions and then nuclear deal and the rest is history. But Woman Life yeah. Freedom, completely yeah. different because, as you said, the breadth of it, the depth of it was from north, south, east, west. Even on Keith, you saw people protesting. It might not have had the numbers like in two, but the scale and the depth of it was altogether different, as well as the fact mm -hmm. that it was very clear we want Iran back and that they wanted revolution, not evolution. Yet despite all of that, the mainstream media, Iranians said at the beginning of all of this, please be our voice. Hence the hashtag Masa Amini was tweeted about 125 million times. At first, they wanted one tweet for every Iranian, which is around about 80 million in the population. It surpassed that. And citizen journalism really took effect. Whereas the mainstream networks, mm -hmm. all of them, paid lip service to it or very late to the party or kind of downplayed mm -hmm. it. And like you said, now with Palestine and the war between Israel and Hamas, it's become fashion. It's become fashion where people are jumping on the bandwagon, wall-to-wall mm -hmm. -wall coverage. But where was that coverage when women were fighting for woman life freedom, for the light, when they were getting raped, tortured, blinded, killed, fell on their fears? And that's why at times Iranians feel that these, the mainstream and other Western entities are not always following what's best for Iran, and there's other things at work. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can't blame them because when you have an a, a, a entire population or the majority of 80 million people, there are polls that have been done inside Iran. And by the way, the, the man who administered those polls is now in hiding. So I won't give his name or the findings of his polls, but I did get to speak to him over the last month. And I, and it's crazy because these polls have to come out. And you understand that the Iranian people, when they come to the street and they tell them, tell us, they tell the world, you're absolutely right to say that this time around was quite different than it was under Obama, but there was something that was very similar. And that's the man that was in the White House this time around and last time. The Biden administration is just a less eloquent version of the Obama presidency. So that's why you are seeing Iran's regime be so brazen as to shoot down protesters, shoot their eyes out, rape them, imprison them, hang them. And now, just yesterday, they had a major cyber attack here in the United States in the state of Pennsylvania. Of course, they became more brazen because the message from the White House from day one, when Biden came in, he didn't even give any preconditions. He made the Iranians know, even in his campaigning, that he was going to go back into the Iran nuclear deal, that he was going to wine and dine them again until they got a deal. And guess what? The Iran regime became so brazen and they were asking for so much that each time Antony Blinken, our secretary of state, went back to Vienna to the negotiating table. The Iran regime's requests were so egregious that even this administration could not agree to them. And what happened, very much to their chagrin, both the United States and Iran, they played out the clock to the point where this war with Iran 
funding an actual terror attack against our ally, Israel, in the Middle East became the inconvenience for them to continue on with their Iran nuclear deal negotiations. So they put it on pause, but they continue to give them the money. We had a very lopsided prisoner exchange with Iran. We gave them an extra $6 billion on top. Not necessary. The deal was already lopsided and not fair in, in the favor of Iran's regime. They removed vital sanctions from Iran's regime, allowing them to find new trading partners like China to sell oil with a revenue of 60 to $90 billion on their own. Just within the last three years of the Biden presidency, Iran's regime has not only recovered from the sanctions that we had under Trump and pre uh, previously, but they surpassed that with money that they made themselves. So people talk about, oh, that $6 billion check hasn't been cashed yet. It's still sitting somewhere. Who cares about that? They already made 60 to 90 billion on their own. And just last week, we heard about another up to $10 billion that will be unfrozen and, and uh, given to, or, or at least available to Iran's regime. So the message from the White House isn't to worry the, uh, Iran's regime about women life freedom. It's not to tell them, oh, please stop killing or executing uh, these peaceful protesters. There's no message about them stopping to fund proxies like the Houthis in Yemen. Actually, the Biden administration took the Houthis off the terror list, if you recall. So the messaging and the policy from the White House from day one of Biden's administration has been in favor of Iran's regime. And they've played it out. They've done wonderfully for themselves. And that's why we saw the timing of this attack. And that's why you see the mainstream media, if you have watched any of these press briefings from the White House with the reporters asking about this current conflict, all you hear about is this, it's almost like the Hamas press corps, all of these questions in favor of Hamas, in favor of Hamas, when will there be a ceasefire? They're not even asking when will 240 innocent civilians who were literally waking up on a Saturday morning and taken hostage, many of whom Children who saw their parents being burned to death, being shot to death right in front of their eyes, innocent civilians, the press is not even asking for them to be returned. So it's very interesting how we got to where we got, and it's a combination of things, whether it's the Obama and Biden presidency, which totally betrayed the Iranian people and led to the terror attacks that we're seeing right now. Do you see the Biden administration also ignoring the proxy attacks in Syria and Iraq against U.S. assets? They're totally ignoring it because they don't want to get involved in a war against Iran. They almost want to be like, it's almost like a pesky little toddler. You don't want to punish that toddler. You want them to stop being a pest, but you don't really want to punish that child. So it's exactly how the Biden administration is handling Iran's regime. Oh, stop it. You're being annoying with these attacks on in uh, Syria and Iraq, but they don't want to punish them. They want to get back into a deal with them. That is the goal. That is what they're hoping will be the crown jewel of Biden's presidency in terms of his foreign policy, because he has nothing else to really flaunt. Just like Obama did. Obama thought that the Iran nuclear deal in 2015 was the absolute best thing he ever did. And a lot of people thought that it was the best thing. And a lot of people thought it was the worst thing. I spoke, I have interviewed a lot of Democrats who actually left the party after the Iran nuclear deal because they actually understood foreign policy and they understood how dangerous this deal was for the future of the Middle East. And now we're seeing that trickle right here. We're seeing it at our southern border. We're seeing people from Afghanistan, Iran's regime, people who are on the FBI's most wanted list showing up at our border. And it will be here in the United States very soon. I'm sure it's going to be all over Europe as well. Look, if ISIS had its way with the small army that it had in having attacks in the in, in Europe, for example, or do-it-yourself or one-off attacks all over the world, Iran's regime is much more complex and sophisticated and much more well-endowed. We saw this with Hezbollah, their main terror proxy in Lebanon, shooting into northern Israel, and of course, funding and training Hamas, as we, as, as we saw in the October 7th massacre in, inside Israel. So all roads lead back to Tehran and more than that, the empowering that the Biden administration before that, the Obama administration did to bring Iran to this level of confidence, wealth, and just being extremely bold and brazen in all of its moves. Yeah, because the Democrat, going back to Jimmy Carter and the revolution against the Shah, he's one of the, the most treacherous people and someone who betrayed Iran more than any other. Like, politician in modern history and then like you said Obama and then you have Biden and they've been as weak as water and all that virtue signaling all those platitudes 
Well, a lot of it for mm. a lot of Iranians, they say you can stick it where the sun doesn't shine because talk is cheap and it's the actions. You judge a person not by what they say, by what they do. They played a game of smoke and mirrors. At one side, you saw interviews with Biden and stuff saying, yeah, it's, it looked like he was championing woman life freedom and everything else. And then the next minute, you hear that they're doing some grubby deals behind the back, behind the backs of Ira Iranians and what's going on. And, and for a lot of Ira Iranians, they say, look, just don't deal with the regime. Call your ambassadors. Stop dealing with them. Stop giving them a platitude. Right. Don't give them right. the chairmanship of a human rights organization oh within God. the UN. Absolutely straight. A joke. A joke. With the butcher Absolutely. of Tehran arriving in, in, in NYC. And with and for a lot of Iranians, language matters as well. That's why a lot of Iranians say, not Iran, the Islamic Republic. Not Iran, Correct. the Ayatollah regime, because Iranians want it very clear right. to the world that regime does not represent Iranians. So that's why a lot of the times Iranians like to correct people who try to equate and bracket and put in the same bucket the Islamic Republic and Iran and correct it because language is going to be more and more important. And that becomes a, a source of knowledge and educating people. Because the average person who isn't a political anorak or hasn't got skin in the game or doesn't have a connection by virtue of birthright or background or history, being either half Iranian, half British like me and yourself, they want it very simplified. What they hear on the radio, what they hear in the news in terms of understanding. Right. And that's why the more we educate, the more language we, we use correctly, the better that is for Iran and Iranians. I wanted to ask you, woman life freedom, it lasted, the resilience of it was like nothing we saw before in terms of continuity of the protest. And then obviously it got crushed the streets because the brutality was ratcheted up. We don't have civil disobedience with the hijab because there's three pillars of the Islamic Republic. There's death to America, death to Israel and the hijab. And the brave Iranian lionesses are out mm -hmm. there fighting their front center. In your experience of these things, how do you see this playing out? Is it going to be something of a footnote that we look back on and we remember those days of woman life freedom and we wait another few years or another five or six years? Or is this really the beginning of the end where either they're going to dissolve from within in terms of their own destruction, where they can fight the kiss mm -hmm. to, to get that Game of Thrones of the ring, or something else is going to happen? And the October the 7th incident is a step too far where no more containment is actually now confronting a menace when it comes to the eye to the regime. It's an interesting question because I, I we had dinner with friends of ours last night who are extremely progressive actually. And the husband said something very interesting. He said, we're at a point where we grew up thinking these are all conspiracy theories, whatever they may be, just in, in general conspiracy theories. And now we realize that there's a lot of truth to many conspiracy theories. One of the conspiracy theories that I grew up with was this whole Jimmy Carter was behind the, the entire revolution. If the United States didn't want it, it wouldn't have happened. And growing up, we took that with a grain of salt. We're like, no, there must have been some, there must have been some elements within the Iranian people that wanted this or else it wouldn't happen, right? Because we, we think in an American sense, like there was protest that this happened, that happened. And I actually just wrote an op-ed a couple months ago for Newsweek saying President Carter owes the Iranian people an apology. Because when you see that, and really, I just want to, it, it, the op-ed did, did very well because I don't think a lot of, especially Americans, understand this. And they saw it as, again, conspiracy theory. But when you draw the lines and you understand how the United States went about it, you are, you absolutely cannot deny that if the United States did not want to see regime change in Iran, it wouldn't have happened. And by the same token, when 9-11 happened, we saw both actually the UK and the United States saying, we're not going to touch Iran. Our, our, the, the axis of evil is not Iran. And in the aftermath of Massa Amini, the first thing we saw An Antony Blinken saying, and you're absolutely right to say, Biden would come on and say, we support the protesters. Blinken would come on the next day and say, we will not support regime change. We're not in the business of regime change. And whenever I have pressed so many lawmakers on this, they would always say, since we went into Afghanistan and Iraq, we're regime change averse. So we don't really 
we won't be doing that for a while. Meaning the United States won't take that up as a policy because it backfired in, in, in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And then you just think that's baloney because there's no one size fits all solution for the entire Middle East, particularly with Iran. And now to bring it back to the first point, the Iranian people understand that a few things are true. Number one, the mass movement made, to use the, the Western term in a better way, they're woke. They're now, they awoken something within people that even if tomorrow the regime came and said, none of you have to wear hijab, you could walk around naked for all we care because they want to stay in power. The Iranian people would say reform is BS. What you're telling us is BS. We still want you gone. 10% of the population, and I don't think people really... Uh, know this, 10% of the population probably caused the, the revolution, meaning they, they were the catalysts that were involved in the revolution of 79. And I would say about 10% of the population right now would want this regime to stay. So we're talking about a good 90% that would want this regime to go. And that is not going anywhere. That momentum, that feeling is not going anywhere. But what they do understand and what they what was confirmed to them, perhaps they learned it like I did through their parents' stories that, oh, the West has to be involved. Now they it was confirmed to them, it was proven to them by the Biden administration that until the West, meaning the United States in particular, has a policy of supporting, not perhaps not engaging in, but supporting regime change for Iran, it will not happen. And because of this, I've, I hear a lot of Iranians saying, let's see who the next president is, because they understand that if you have someone in the White House who does not want regime change, it's not going to happen. And we're seeing it, right? All the money, all the emboldening, all this, taking the Houthis off the list, making them the head of the UN, giving them all these rights, allowing them to march into to New York City like it's no big deal when they have a lot of blood on their hands, even American blood on their hands. It's all being ignored because of this main policy. I went to uh, Washington, D.C. in February, and I gave a few briefings to members of Congress and, and Senate on the mass on what's going on in Iran at the moment. I then had some private meetings with two very important and high profile senators where we talked about different things and different ideas for the Middle East. And when we talked about Iran, we actually started with, and I went with a Lebanese friend of mine, he's an expert on Lebanon and Hezbollah. And he said, why doesn't the United States try to at least curb Hezbollah's influence in Lebanon? We give money to the Lebanon Free Army. The United States gives a lot of aid to them. There should be some kind of contingency on that check that says, you know what, why don't you keep certain parts free of Hezbollah so that the Christian community and the secular Lebanese community can nation build and can build up that area of Lebanon to rid itself of this cancerous Hezbollah terror organization. And both senators who are both very much anti-terror and very strong on these things and happen to be conservatives said, in this town, you cannot punish Iran's regime. And they both said it in different ways, but that was the sentiment that I walked away with, knowing that there is such a strong pro- Ayatollah ideology throughout Washington at this moment with the Biden administration that you cannot pass any sort of legislation that would punish any one of its tentacles. And that's exactly where it starts. And I came back and I tweeted, Khamenei has more friends in Washington, D.C. than he does in Tehran, because at, at that time, the protests were still going on. And so many people understood that and so many people fought back. And what do you mean that? Uh, and it's true, unless you go and you get that you understand this nuance of why wouldn't the United States want to curb Iran's influence? Why wouldn't they want to cut off their tentacles, whether it's in Yemen or Iraq and Syria and Lebanon? And now in, in Gaza, we're seeing that is it is a direct reflection of the empowerment that we that we've done, that we've grown them and we've fed them and we've given them money. And now they're using it against Israel. And that is just a microcosm, a small example of what's about to un unfold and unleash onto the world, because Iran knows that there are no consequences. Every time they have done something very problematic and in terms of capturing warships, in terms of, care of, of capturing oil uh, carriers in the seas, in terms of holding Americans hostage, in terms of feeding its terror proxies, 
killing innocent protesters, you name it. That list has gotten longer and longer. And the benefits coming from Washington, D.C. have also gotten longer and longer. So they keep getting these bonuses and checks and they continue on with their bad behavior. So the Iranian people are not blind. They're actually very smart and astute. And they're watching all of this and they're thinking the media is not going to help us. The Biden administration is not going to help us. We have to help ourselves. That's why one of the slogans that you heard on the street this past year during the protests was, if you're not going to help us, at least don't stand in our way. I'm I'm paraphrasing a lot because the slogans are really cute and they rhyme and they're very much, they're very powerful. But the Iranian way, the Iranian people have a very creative way of of protesting in all of their slogans. There's another one says, not Gaza, not Lebanon. I will die only for Iran, um, which is very meaningful. It's to say, we don't care about your talking points. For for 44 years, you tried to convince us that the Iran-Iraq war was necessary, that if we send our young boys into war, they come back or they don't come back, they become shaheed, we should be martyrs, we should be so happy and we should celebrate that. that that the Palestinians are our brethren and the Israelis are our enemies. And now we're coming to realize it's the other way around. The Israelis are the ones who stood with women, life, freedom. They lit up their buildings. They protested on the streets of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv for Masa Amini and women, life, freedom. And now many Iranians are speaking out in, in, in support of Israel as well saying to the regime, we don't believe in your talking points. We don't believe in the brainwashing that you've tried to do. And of course, we don't believe in the money that you're, the Iranian people's money that you're pouring into terrorism and your terror proxies and all of your different nefarious activities. Yeah, because Ayatollah Biden and Robert Mali, who Iranians loathe, have let down Iran and Iranians. Robert Mali, I think I'm correct. Didn't he make Yasser Arafat a godfather to one of his kids? I don't know about godfather, but I know that they were very close. I don't know if that would be true. But Robert Malley and a few others were, there there was an investigative piece, I'm sure, very recently about how there are people who work and continue to work right at this moment in Biden's cabinet that have direct ties to Iran's regime. Literally, this woman, there were emails where this woman was saying, I have a meeting with so-and-so, do you want me to go? He's, she was asking Iran's foreign minister how to, how to best serve him while she is serving in her position in the United States cabinet. Yeah, Amir the liar, I, I call him. Following on. Not work. Not at the yeah, job. following on from his predecessor, Zarif the liar. And they're clever because they're a sophisticated theocracy that uses some fluffy faces like Zarif the liar used to go around with his fluffy face, little smile, best friend was John Kerry and all of that kind of, to manipulate things. And then we had all that kind of stuff around NIAC and the tentacles of utilizing, infiltrating, reverse engineering the institutions of the West to try to gain traction, to try to gain influence. It's been a, it's been a real thing and a big problem. And then you've got the mainstream media like Ayatollah BBC, which did wall-to-wall coverage when it came to the 1979 revolution and the Shah, but yet very absent or can't even use the term terrorist to define Hamas. No, and they were allowed to go to the the anti-Hamas rally yesterday. BBC told them not to. And Iranians stand with Israel because they've been living in 44 years of terror. And Iranians and the Jews have a long history from Cyrus the Great who freed the Jew. And... It was one of the few communities that were there in support of women life freedom. Whereas you didn't hear much, sadly, from the streets of Palestine regarding women life freedom, because the Islamic Republic is one of the main benefact is one of the main people that fund Hamas and those entities to the detriment of Iranians that live under hyperinflation where they can't afford the price of bread from one day to the next where the resources of Iran go to to vis-a-vis Hezbollah, vis-a-vis Hamas. Because their constituents, their people, on the streets are not the streets of Iran, from Tabriz to Tehran, from Kurdistan to Baluchistan. It is Lebanon. It is Gaza. It is Iraq. And that's why people are so sick and tired of it, because I did this in one of my posts. If you're given boiled chicken, every day of your life for 44 years and force-fed Palestine, Lebanon, and Gaza. Guess what? You don't want to eat any more boiled chicken. 
So that's why you see videos where they say, where in football stadiums, where they have the Palestine flag at times, they, they say to football fans, you can stick it where the sun don't shine. Because they're sick and tired of it. People want to live. And unfortunately, Islamic Republic, for the last 44 years for Iranians and Iran, has created this curtain of darkness where it's actually fanned the flames and loves misery. The misery of right. the people inside Iran. Because misery loves right. company. And that's why Iranians have gone abroad. That's why you find 8 million Iranians, because they go for hope. They go for opportunity. They go for life. Because a lot of Iranians, yeah. for those of you not Iranian, Iranians love to party. They love life. They, like, they want love. They, they don't love want hate. They don't want they any do. of that. And I um, and it goes against the Iranians and the Israelis. The other thing they have in common is that they're the two nations of the Middle East who are like that, who do value modernism and value. We're seeing a lot more from other moderate Arab states. I think that's why we saw the Abraham Accords, because a lot of these states were like, what? We're over it. We want to have iPads and we want to have apps and we want Israel to come in and make us more modern. And that's great. But I think at the core of it, the Iranian people and the Israeli people have more in common than any other nations of the Middle East, whereas the Arab nations have had Islam for much longer, and it's rooted in a lot of their way of life. For Iranians, I think if you made the proposition to Iranians, we're going to all follow the Zoroastrian way because that, the, the, basically a lot of that is, is, is rooted in the culture. I think you would have a mass conversion to Zoroastrianism tomorrow. That's why we're seeing a lot of Iranians even convert to Christianity in underground churches. It's a huge movement because Iranians have a difficult time connecting with the brand of Islam that's offered to them. And for that reason, they want to connect with God. They want to connect in some meaningful way with some higher being. And they just don't they look at their government and like you said, they don't want it anymore. They just don't want this anymore. And that's why we're, we see a very natural, and we saw this under the Shah. We, you, you, you alluded back to Cyrus the Great, which is a beautiful thing because I think people really don't know the history. But under the Shah of Iran, I think Israel and, and Iran had a wonderful political relationship and they had reciprocity. They had a lot of respect for one another. And of course, that's been lost. But I think once... You, you have this uh, this generation in Iran that looks to their parents and said, what the heck were you thinking if you went out onto the streets and protested? Why did you do this to us? It's interesting because now they say, if you're not, if you didn't get your country back after, after your revolution, we're going to get it back for you. And that's why you see so much bravery coming out of the Iranian people. That's why you see them finding or really opposing a lot of the talking points. They're all about women's rights. They're all about religious rights. They're all about freedom of expression in, in all of its ways, whether it's about fashion or about speech or about protesting the government. So I'm actually so proud of this generation of Iranians. A lot of them, it's funny because right now when you see this war going on between Israel and Hamas, you have more, unfortunately, Hamas sympathizers among Iranians living in Europe and the United States than you do inside Iran. And I know that's a very broad statement to make, but I have talked with enough people to make that generalization. Inside Iran, it's again, they have an awakening. And I feel like a lot of the Iranians who live in Europe or the United States perhaps are still under this influence of their parents' talking points or under the West's influence, or they are following, or they went to university and they became more radicalized that way, or it's just a leftist way of viewing the world where the Ayatollahs aren't so bad and Hamas is not bad, but Israel is the colonizer and the United States is the colonizer, and which is a lot of false information out there. But it's very interesting to see the this coming of age of the Iranian people because of their 44 years, because of the experiences that they have. And I think to bring this to a positive place, I do think they will get their revolution in their time. I just don't see this generation living under this regime. I just think they need that help. They need that support. And hopefully it will match up where they are in a place of wanting to continue with their revolution and having someone in the White House who will support their revolution so that we can reverse the doings of Carter and Obama and Biden and to give the Iranian people the revolution that they deserve. And they really do deserve it. And as we come towards the end right. of this, Iranians are one of the most highly educated populations 
across the Middle East. And in the yeah. United States. And you've got people that have master's degrees, but they can't even get a job on a building site. What Iranians want, from all of my speaking to Iranians, living there, etc., my passion, my love for Iran, they want a passport to be proud. Mm -hmm. they, want a, they want Iran back. They want to be able to travel the world. They want to be able yep. to have opportunity. They want to have a job when they do a degree. They want to be able to have a life. They want to have opportunity. They want to have a country where it's got its respect back, where it's open to the world, rather than being this closed country that suffocates and clips the wings of Iranians and Iran. And exactly. all things come to an end at the end of the day is that great, I think it's either Gandhi or someone who said that every dictator, every single one of them, in the end, has come to an end. And sometimes with revolution, it seems mm. impossible until it actually happens. So I want to thank you for your time. We've had a good chat, all things Iran and revolution. And obviously, I knew it was going to be very politics and political based, your background. And I, I just, for me, it's a passion uh, and it's important to try to do your bit. So where can people reach out to you in terms of your socials if you want to find out more what you're doing, et cetera? If you want to sign up for our daily top 10 email, you can go to foreigndesknews.com. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram and YouTube under Lisa Daftari, my full name, and on Facebook as well. So we're on all the social sites, except for TikTok. We're not on TikTok. We won't be. But you can follow the Foreign Desk or Lisa Daftari, and you can keep up with all the day's headlines on the website again, foreigndesknews.com. Khaili Mamoun, which is thank you very much for those of you who don't speak Farsi with my lips. Farsi. <laughs> I know the good words and the naughty words. I appreciate your time. Yeah. And this has been Successful Arabia. Thank you.